Sometimes as an English teacher, I get a student to submit something that I think is brilliant. It'll have truly original ideas, make me think new thoughts, genuinely give me a perspective that I didn't have before. But when I look at the rubric and the actual demands of the assignment, I'll notice a disconnect. It doesn't actually follow the instructions. It's missing sections demanded by the rubric and I'm stuck. I mean, what am I supposed to do? There's my private belief that the essay is a good essay and deserving of the highest mark, but there is the public standard by which we are evaluated, and that tells me that this thing needs to be corrected, that it's bad, actually. In Act 2 of Measure for Measure, Angelo and Isabella, two characters who, though they would prefer to be left alone, have been thrown into the world of crime and punishment to debate this very question. Should a public standard of behavior, a set of laws, supersede the private desire for mercy? And what power do we invoke when we decide our fidelity is to the law? And what power do we invoke when we believe ourselves capable of extending mercy outside of that law? In this video, we're going to analyze Act 2 of Measure for Measure, play by play, and we're going to see how Shakespeare explores these questions. The act starts with Aeschylus arguing that Claudio should be pardoned. And there are some good arguments in there. He says he knows Claudio to be most straight in virtue, and that anyone, even Angelo, could have erred in this point which now you censure him. And he has some arguments that don't really land as well with modern audiences, like the appeal to Claudio's family privilege. Aeschylus says that Claudio had a most noble father. He comes from a good family and all that. But altogether, Aeschylus seems to miss the point. Angelo is trying to re-establish state power, so Claudio is actually the perfect person to make an example of. His choice to make an example of Claudio is exactly because of the points outlined by Aeschylus. If that law can come down on virtuous kid from a good family, then it can come down on anyone. Everyone should fear the law, the public standard, the official guidelines for what it means to be a good person. Angelo's response to Aeschylus is that the law needs to punish what it catches, what's open made to justice that justice seizes. Even though he knows others violate the same laws, he has the power to punish who he catches, and Juliet is pregnant, so Claudio is guilty. Aeschylus' response is great. If Claudio isn't going to be forgiven in Vienna, well, heaven forgive him, and forgive us all. Some rise by sin, and some by virtue fall. Some run from breaks of ice and answer none, and some condemned for a fault alone. None alone? I feel like they should rhyme. I wonder how I'm supposed to have said that. So, some rise by sin, and some by virtue fall. That's a good line. Some are perceived as doing their job well when they do wrong by others, in this case, the failure to extend mercy, and some by virtue fall, in this case, Claudio's loving consensual relationship. Or... Or, maybe, he's talking about Angelo's strict virtue and how his devotion to his virtue of chastity will make him a murderer. It works on multiple levels. And that's why it's a good line. At this point in the act, it's clear we all need some comic relief. So, Elbow shows up. And we've got to respect that a play so dependent on substitutions in the plot, Angelo subbing in for the Duke, Lucio subbing in to speak on behalf of Claudio, to ask if Isabella can sub in to speak on behalf of Claudio, and so on. There will be more substitutions that we haven't got to yet, but we're going to get there. So in a play so dependent on substitutions, the comic relief is an incompetent man who holds some authority and mixes up words. For example, he says stuff like, My wife, sir, whom I detest before heaven. I hope that you were all able to find as much joy in that scene as I did. And even Elbow is a substitution. He says that the other sheriffs are glad to choose me for them. They're happy to let him do the work on their behalf. Everybody is doing work on behalf of another. Participation in the social fabric of Vienna, or the world generally, is mandatory in this play. Claudio and Isabella wanted to escape it, but you can't. Everybody's connected and responsible for each other. Anyway, Elbow brings on to the stage Pompey and Froth. Pompey works in a brothel, and it seems like Froth is a patron. They are there to be judged by Angelo and Aeschylus. Though Angelo leaves quickly, and as soon as he does, Aeschylus pardons both of them with a warning. Notably, he doesn't follow the letter of the law. 
he's being the good cop to Angelo's bad cop, while also showing that ultimately laws are enforced by humans and will be applied inconsistently. It's the humans who judge each other, not the statutes. In scene two, we see Isabella plead on Claudio's behalf. She basically tells Angelo to hate the sin, but not the sinner. I have a brother is condemned to die. I do beseech you, let it be his fault and not my brother. Angelo isn't having that though. It's his job, as he says, to find the faults whose fine stands in record and let go by the actor. More clearly, his job is to catch who he catches and punish the sin by punishing the one who performs that sin. Isabella seems to give up. She says, I had a brother then. And I find this line really interesting because it calls attention to how she is centering herself in the plea for Claudio. Her argument up until this point has been almost entirely about her and her virtue. There are many reasons to believe that Isabella is the moral center of this play, but she fetishizes her own virtue here, and this line really made me aware of it. Her brother is going to die, and she makes it about her. Her speech is filled with eyes. But luckily, Lucio is there to encourage her not to give up. Her arguments become stronger and more energetic and more focused on Claudio with his support. She says, for example, that if it were her brother, her brother would be good enough to forgive Angelo if the roles were reversed. She says, if he had been as you and you as he, you would have split like him, but he, like you, would not have been so stern. Claudio would have had mercy, she argues but Angelo outsources his moral responsibility here. It's not him that is unmerciful, it is the law. It is the law, not I, condemn your brother. It's the rubric and not the teacher. The game, not the player. As this scene goes on, Isabella gets more and more impassioned. Everyone seems to be rooting for her in this scene. Her arguments attack the way the legal systems protect the powerful. That in the captain's but a choleric word, which in the soldiers is a flat blasphemy. And she attacks the pride of any human who thinks they can stand in judgment of another. But man, proud man, dressed in a little brief authority, most ignorant of what he's most assured, his glassy essence, like an angry ape, plays such fantastic tricks before high heaven as makes the angels weep, who with our spleens would all themselves laugh mortal. It's an epic rant. It's moving. It's Isabella at her best but it's unsuccessful in convincing Angelo to change his mind. This is not to say it doesn't have an effect on Angelo, though. When Isabella leaves the room, Angelo has a chance to address the audience alone, and we see his inside thoughts. It seems he's got a bit of a crush. He asks himself, Dost thou desire her foully for those things that make her good? Oh, let her brother live. But then he returns to his original position. Thieves, for their robbery, have authority when judges steal themselves. Thieves get away with robbery when the judges are also thieves. So, if he, the judge, lusts after Isabella, then those who lust will get away with it and Vienna becomes a den of sin. That just can't happen. So he's into her, and that crush is messing with him. It shakes his identity. It seems Claudio was right about her unspoken ability to move men with her physicality. Angelo wants to see her again, to hear her speak again, and perhaps because of this, he mimics some of her arguments in his final speech of scene two. If everyone is sinful in Vienna, who is he to punish Claudio? Who can judge when we're all guilty? And there's some interesting stuff in this. Most dangerous is that temptation that doth goad us on to sin in loving virtue. He seems to be lusting after her because she is virtuous to sin in loving virtue. By loving her and pursuing her, part of him thinks that he can obtain her goodness by obtaining her. Though he, he does also seem to understand that this is a really dangerous and flawed way of thinking, yet he does conclude that this virtuous maid subdues him. In Shakespeare's time, this has theological undertones. Like, can you pray to a saint, or a picture of Christ, or visit a holy relic, and acquire some of the goodness associated with the lives represented by those surrogates? Can worshiping Christ indirectly through those surrogates be successful? Can loving Isabella 
be a path to loving God. This is at the core of Reformation theology. Protestant movements largely refrain from using religious imagery or prayers to saints, but Catholics celebrate it. And in the Church of England, which seeks a middle path between the two, all things are up for debate. I don't have any thoughts or answers about those theological questions, but I'm pretty sure that the question about treating a human being as a path to redemption or generally treating a human being as symbolic rather than, you know, a human, is going to put Angelo on a dangerous path here. Isabella is a truly strange version of the manic pixie dream girl for him. To be fair to Angelo, I don't know why I'm being fair to Angelo, but to be fair to Angelo, it does seem like he knows this about himself, but can't stop. And sure enough, a scene later, Angelo attempts to use his power to coerce Isabella into bed through blackmail. Scene four is intense. But before we get there, in scene three, we see Juliet for the first time, who speaks to the Duke, who is in disguise. She confirms that the union between her and Claudio was consensual, and she, unlike Pompey or Lucio, or some others, has been successfully shamed. Even though it was a consensual act between two loving partners, she repents. Everything the law and these public shamings are intended to do, they have done with Juliet. And yet, the father of her child is still going to die. So for most of the characters in this play, the public shaming and loss of reputation with it that comes with being caught in brothels does nothing. They all laugh about it and continue on. But the two who plan to be married and start a family together are deeply affected by this shame. So this premise that the laws of Vienna seem to start with, that shame and punishment will clean up the brothels and return Vienna to some purity of the past, that just, it just doesn't seem to be what's happening here. Shame doesn't work on them. It only works on two people who actually seem to be in love. The rubric, it just seems to be broken here. So let's go to act four, when Angelo just keeps on propositioning Isabella, keeps on using his position of authority to coerce her into bed. He first does it as a hypothetical. He asks if she would give up her body to redeem her brother. She responds, again hypothetically, that she should rather give up her body than her soul. So he pushes further and asks whether or not there might be an ambiguous line between charity and sin if the sin is committed to save a brother's life. Now, I cannot tell what's happening here in the scene. I aspire to be some sort of literary critic who always says, I don't know when I do not know, and this play has a lot of those moments. The last thing that happens in the play is going to be a big I don't know for me. And here, in this scene, is a big I don't know. I cannot tell if Isabella understands his propositions from the start and is simply smarter than he is. Like, she's forcing him to dance around the issue in the belief that he will not have the guts to blackmail her directly, that his shame will only permit him to hint at the coercion, allowing her to escape this conversation without direct confrontation? Or does she honestly not see it? Is she so pure, so chaste, that she cannot recognize when a creepy guy is blackmailing her for sex? I don't know. I suppose the choice belongs to the director and the actor cast in that role. Either way, Angelo does say it directly in the end. He says, I love you, and that Claudio will not die if you give me love. Nothing hypothetical about that. She, of course, calls out his hypocrisy and asks for a pardon right there, or she'll tell the whole world, hashtag me too. Or with an outstretched throat, I'll tell the world aloud what man thou art. He responds by saying that no one will believe her. No one ever believes women who make these accusations. Before walking off the stage, he commands, redeem thy brother by yielding up thy body to my will. So Angelo begins this act by outsourcing his private morality to the law. And by the end of this act, he has found out that he no longer has that private restraint that was literally his defining characteristic at the start of the play. The rubric isn't only broken in Vienna, by using the rubric as a surrogate for his own morality, Angelo has completely lost himself. When we justify the judgment of others by pointing towards some public standard, we lose ourselves and our own ability to judge right from wrong privately. Angelo loses his identity trying to enforce a public standard of behavior, and in the process commits an act of coercive sexual violence against Isabella. Isabella is poignantly left alone on stage at the end of this act, and resolves that she will not do it, which takes us to Act 3, and we'll discuss that next week. Please subscribe if you want to be notified when that video comes out. Thank you for watching.